Hi guys and welcome back on the channel. As we're approaching to my gold number and let's just say dream when I started these YouTube videos uh, because I never, you know, like thought that I would succeed like 10,000 subscribers. I'm going to share uh, like some very special for the first time my homemade kitchen analysis with you in your favorite opening Dragon for Black. And also I want to share with you like a couple of very interesting stories. So let's get started. Um, just like I told you, uh, we're actually reaching 10,000 subscribers in like next couple of days. And uh, for the next two weeks, uh, you're going to be able to see like a big number of very interesting videos. Uh, I'm not going to tell you and reveal anything. Those are going to be like surprises uh, with lots of interesting uh, content. Uh, uh, you're going to be able to see some of my students. Uh, you're going to be able to see some of like, I don't know, special uh, blitzing, stuff like that. And uh, lots of funny and attractive videos. Let's get started with this dragon file. Uh, I remember I was playing tournament back to 2018, um, actually 2009, uh, on Iceland in Reykjavik, and uh, I got very disappointed uh, after third round of that tournament, uh, where I lost a completely winning game um, against uh, Grandmaster, and uh, just as you know, uh, in those situations, what are you going to do? But um, actually, I went to the bar with one of my, actually with two of my students, Maggie, uh, who was originally from uh, Iceland, but uh, he he's working in Luxembourg uh, as a bank player, and who came there to meet me. Uh, and another guy was Thomas from Denmark, from Copenhagen, who also came uh, from Copenhagen to meet me in Reykjavik and we had a very nice time I but still I was very disappointed you know how it goes we were like younger and uh, uh, we actually uh, at some point got drunk I was very disappointed and I said what do you want me to play tomorrow I'm gonna give you like all kinds of choices I I'll be black I was supposed to play against uh, guy 2200 feet uh, and uh, I just asked my, uh, Thomas and Maggie so guys you have a choice to choose and uh, Thomas said Maya play the dragon and I said okay I'm gonna play the dragon but if he goes for the long castle because everybody goes for the long castle lately am I supposed to play the mainline d5 a little bit like Drovish 94, but nowadays even it's even considered to be suspicious for black, or to play like absolutely the worst but trickiest one, bishop d7. He said, Go for the trickiest one. I said, Okay, there we go. Uh, I went on the game, and this is the game I want to show you. Uh, along with the game that I'm about to show you, I'm going to show you like a big number of analysis here. Uh, and uh, games that I want here. Believe it or not, my score, according to stats, is 97%. And it's not 97% out of like 20 games, out of 146 games. So that basically means that I won like more than, uh, like, well, that actually means 97 wins out of 100 games. So, Let's get started and uh, let me just show you how do we do, uh, reach this variation. f3, e4, c5, knight f3. I always go with d6. Occasionally, I used to teach my students to play g6 first to avoid all those Raza Limo lines and some side lines by black, sorry, by white. Uh, but lately, I believe that it's not just like that, that all the top guys go for d6. After d4, c takes, knight takes, knight f6, knight c3, and there we go, the dragon. Um, one of the most popular, most attractive, and uh, most tactical openings in the world. After like bishop e3, bishop g7, f3, castles, queen d2, knight c6. Um, according to, not my stats, but according to official 
uh, stats of the chess base when you go and when you analyze like uh, the dragon um like 75 percent of the games people go with this setup and now it is going to divide 10 percent of these guys go for g4 it's a very old-fashioned variation that nigel short um and at that time um anatoly karpov used to play like back to 80s with lots of success nowadays it's considered to be good for black when you go with bishop e6 uh, another option after like queen d2 knight c6 is uh like 45 45 so if we divide this position like 100 percent 10 percent of uh, games you're gonna get and face this g4 move and you have like equal chance to face long castle and bishop c4 long castle is called rouser line against the dragon and uh, bishop c4 is a called uh yugoslav variation against the dragon version it's considered to be the most tactical and most challenging against the dragon but at the same time most exciting although long castle lately when i played dragon i all the time faced the long castle and here for example like uh, four days ago, I played against a uh, famous Brazilian GM, Alexander Fier, and I played in Serbia Open D5, and I won. According to stats, once again, uh, like D5 happens in like 75 or 80% of the games, I believe, while you have like 94 as an old-fashioned move that is not anymore considered to be good, and Bishop D7, which is considered to be absolute waste of time uh, because in this line they do not waste time uh, just like in the Yugoslav with the bishop going on c4 and then recreating it to b3 anyways i still go with the bishop d7 and that's the specialty i'd like to share with you uh, i'm gonna go even step uh, forward and to tell you that i never lost a tournament game in this line even though in all the articles in all the literature and everywhere else, it's considered to be almost lost for black. I can probably say that even Carlson used this variation when he was young, I believe 13 years old. Nakamura used it when he was younger and managed to win against Verpunsky in the United States Championship. And uh, many other guys, occasionally, usually in blitz or rapid games. Uh, I'm one of the rare guys who used it uh, on. Uh, like I believe in uh, almost all occasions in my tournament chess. Um, so let's get started. You play bishop d7. Once again, I'm going to tell you the drawback of this move is first of all, um, statistically, white scores fantastic against it, unless you play against me, of course. And uh, another thing is uh, that uh, they haven't. Uh, committed themselves with light square bishop and plays that on c4 which means they haven't wasted tempo with bishop c4 and bishop b3 actually two tempi and uh, that actually means where we go with rook c8 95 knight c4 is going to be like a typical waste of time for black so they go g4 they just go with the main line you cannot even imagine how many games i won when they just go with the straight h4 you always go with rook c8. It's very important not to go with an early uh, knight b5. Why? Because when they play h5, you can now take on h5. And the thing is, and the point is, when they play g4, you now just go with the knight g3, attacking both rook and the bishop. People try it against me, queen h2, I take on h1 and win the game. Most of these guys, like zillions of these top gms 2600s 2500s uh on on chess.com 27 2800 played work to h3 you just take on f1 and who would say that this position is almost winning for black looks like we're gonna get baited into moves right so you go 95 threatening knight c4 they all almost automatically go with rook h1 and Get ready, baby, you're gonna get mated. But this is the point. We play knight c4, 
threatening queen and the bishop. And the, right now, this is like a critical moment. Those who play either queen f2, queen d3, uh, queen e2, or even queen h2, you just, believe it or not, react in the same fashion. The main move is queen f2. That's what majority of my opponents do. They defend this bishop. They keep an option of queen h2. They keep an option of rook h7. And most likely, they just want to place the queen on h4 and mate us on the h5. You just play queen b6. Tremendous move by black. And believe it or not, they cannot defend it. They cannot defend it what? They cannot defend the knight on d4 and the bishop on e3 and the pawn on b2. If they move the knight, you take on b2. If they move knight d5, you take on b2. If they retreat knight b3, you take on e3. If they play something else, like rook h7, you take on b2, and then you take on e3, and they just fall apart like a house of cards, c3, d4, and so on. Take a look at these positions at home. Uh, this is like winning for black. Another thing is, if instead of this, they just go with g4. What if they go with g4 or h4? You just have to learn that you got to play rook c8 first. Those who try to sack here, now you understand why did I say that you should go with a rook on c8 first and not to play knight e5. Because they cannot play bishop h6. What's so special about this? You take on d4, you keep the tangent on the center and on the knight on d4. Which means when they give you a check and they go king h8, and just when they think, like, let me meet you, man. No, you're not. Uh, that's not gonna. That's not gonna happen because you just go here and you're completely winning. And uh, just like you see, it's very important to be very accurate here because in couple of games, mostly bullet games where you just played fast. I played ninety five, and then I uh, soon very much regretted for this decision. So rook c eight. Such an important move here, keeping the tension here, and basically after h5, knight h5, they are lost. I mean, they not lost like in the classical sense of that word, but we do not have any problems, and the initiative is on our side. When they go for g4, and that's literally what everybody does, and we, we once again go rook c8, they go h4, and you go knight e5. Most of my opponents think that I'm a complete idiot. Like, this guy, uh, he's like an I am. He pretends to be like a good like player of the dragon variation. And he just plays this variation being down uh, to them. Well, that's not a case. Actually, I do it on purpose. On the other hand, I'm going to bring up the name of my good friend Felater from Croatia. Um, who said, my turns out that the knight on e5 is way better than the light square bishop. And I fully agree with that. Uh, thanks to him, I realized that we shouldn't jump on c4 just like that, which for, eight, you know, like years, decades, were like one of those classic approaches by black. Anyways, uh, when you go with the knight e5, no, you don't want to jump on uh, c4. Yes, that definitely exists as an idea uh, and, you know, at some point. But we don't want to do that right now and just like that. So let me just show you. King b1. Uh, by the way, don't be surprised if somebody first play h4, you do rook c8, and then he goes g4. It's the same. Don't be surprised if somebody first play king b1, you just go rook c8. Literally anything they do, you always go rook c8, knight e5, queen a5. Rook c8, knight e5, queen a5. Rook c8, knight e5, queen a5. Please don't forget about it. And now let me just show you what's happening there. They just go with g4, you go rook c8. They go h4, you go knight e5. I want to place my queen on a5. Whole bunch of games, experiences, and everything else I have in this position. For example, one guy played, not one guy, like uh, international master Bulmaga, Irina Bulmaga, pretty good player, uh, a woman GM, but I am as a man. Uh, I mean, uh, men's I am title. Uh, she played g5. I played knight h5, threatening knight g3. She played rook g1, and I just played rook to c3. 
This is a typical exchange sack in the dragon that gives you like such a great initiative. She captured by queen at late knight f3. She moved right here. I took on h4 and she fell apart and I destroyed her afterwards. Another thing. After like h4, knight e5, h5, you just go with uh, queen a5 things and go into those type of games. Even b5 is a possibility here. But actually, it's going to transpose into the main line. And most of your opponents, believe me, uh, they will go with move like king b1. What's so special about king b1? Uh, they can say um, that's like a typical Sicilian trick by white players. First of all, you know all my videos, you know my book, Butcher the Sicilian. I always claim how in like 99% of cases, uh, king b1 is going to turn out to be useful. And just in 1% of those cases, it's going to be uh, like a bad thing. Here, it's not bad. It's one of the main moves. But actually, I just have to tell you that the reason why they put the king on b1 is not just to defend. I don't know, in the future, pawn on a2, and they just have like a better pro and the proper uh, defense of the knight on c3. I'll explain you why. Uh, but they also think that they prevent queen a5. I said they think. They're in some sort of like fake imagination here. So you go with the queen a5, believe it or not. And there we go. I'm gonna get back to my game from Iceland against 2200 to be that guy. But before that, I gotta show you like a big number of games that I had in these positions. First of all, automatically, 90% of players go with h5. I even played a tournament game against uh, Fide Master Spasic from Serbia, pretty good young I am, 23, 30 approximately. And I took take on F3. Look at this terrific knight sacrifice. No, it's not about only uh, breaking these pawns on the king's side and in the center. When you take on F3, then you sack this rook on C3. And it's crazy because at one point, you sack the knight for the pawn, and now you sack the rook for the knight. Um, when you take a look at this position, you easily realize that you're down a rook. Uh, after they played b takes c3, uh, I only had one game like this. You just go with the knight e4, and they can resign. Yes, you're down a rook, but they, you're threatening to take the queen. You're threatening knight c3, followed by queen a2 with a checkmate. They gotta take by queen. And everyone takes by queen, and everyone thinks like this is something special. Well, no, it, it is something special, but for black, you take on c3, b takes c3, and I gotta stop here and uh, to show you this position for a moment. Take a look at this one. They have like six pawns, two rooks, and three pieces. We got seven pawns, three pieces, and one rook, which basically at the moment means that we're down a rook for the pawn. But take a look at this one. This is a four sequence of moves. We go with the bishop g4, taking second pawn for the rook. They gotta defend. They have to play bishop g2. Same thing would happen if they play bishop e2. You take the third one. And this is a critical position. This is something that you have to analyze. This is something where you have like more than 20, 30 correspondence games. And I believe I'm one of those rare guys who play this with in a tournament chess and managed to win with black pieces. And it actually happened in October last year. So tournament game. I'm not talking about the blitz games here. And you just play knight e4. You just have this beautiful knight, bishop, and you threaten very nasty knight takes c3. Um, when I mentioned those 97% of uh, you know, like results with the bishop d7. This was specifically position that I meant. And uh, uh, in this position, I believe that I almost won all the games. In blitz, not to mention bullet, in rapid games, practically this is undefendable for white. Uh, it's so hard to understand, but it's so nice when you play this in tournament game. Uh, Lots of calculation, uh, the craziness, uh, you know, like on the board, and it's not easy at all. And you gotta keep in mind all the time 
that you're down the road. It's not an easy thing having in mind that you're down the road. Usually when you're down the pond, you just think like, even when you play in compensation, how can I get it back? Well, in this case, you're down the road and you're not trying to get it back. You're actually trying to play on a compensation. So after 94, believe it or not, there is only one move. It's Rook to D3. In that tournament game of mine, I played against Passage. He played Rook to D3. And when I took on C3, he, he has to play King B2. After, actually, he revealed a secret to me like a few days ago when we were in Serbia Open that he played against another student of mine like a bunch of Blitz games. He got demolished in this line by White. I mean, by Black, by my student, uh, Stefan Vladanovic. And then, uh, by the way, that guy is uh, uh, an IM level. And uh, uh, he said, this is why I took the analysis engines and learned it. And against me, he didn't play the best move, King B2, because he was afraid of Knight D1. And there was a Serbian game between uh, Miloš Perunovic, who was white, against Aleksandar Kovacevic. And Perunovic won that game with white pieces. Here, Kovacevic captured an E3, but no, here I'm bringing an improvement over that one, and I'm suggesting Knight B2. So what's so special about Knight B2? You threaten this rook, and you want to go with the Knight C4 afterwards. When they play this, you give check, they go here, and you play D5. All of a sudden, you want to go with E5, A5, rook C8, bishop F8, and even though you're down a rook, okay, this time for the three pawns, I believe this is preferable position for black. I enjoy, and my own experience show that this is way better and more prosperous for black than for white. Spotsage against me played king c1. I captured, and I believe that I took by pawn on h5, but I'm not sure. Maybe I even played something else first, knight c3, then bishop f5. I managed to win the game afterwards. Have fun with this at home. But I'm just going to tell you what in Blitz presents like the most common reaction by 90% of players, even good ones. Bishop d4. Bishop d4, I literally won like hundreds of games. You just played d5. And now when they move the bishop, you take on c3, you take on d1, you push e4, and no, you're not going to be down a rook. You're going to be up like four pawns. Because you're bringing back the piece, first exchange, then win another piece, and you're actually bringing everything back. That's about h5 here. And h5 was so logical, but it brings nothing to white. Then there is another move, a move like g5. I played against uh, Pershin in, from Russia in European Blitz Championship, I just have to say that that was my worst Blitz shape ever. I lost like 200 points in that tournament. And from 2550, I dropped to 2350. And in that game, I played knight h5. He played nice knight d5, threatening my queen and pawn on e7. This is a famous trick. If you take on d2, they first take on e7, and uh, they're winning. And I, bring my, I brought my queen back. And when he played rook g1, since I was threatening here, like very nasty knight g3. Uh, here I played knight c4. Uh, I once again failed uh, to listen, uh, probably the uh, best expert for the dragon in the world. I am Felater from Croatia. And instead of playing b5, because in the dragon you should never care about this pawn, you're actually happy if white takes it and gives you the open file. I played knight c4 and I lost. I was supposed to play b5 with a full. Uh, com compensation for the given pawn, but I would say they don't want to take it actually there. This is like more like counter play and completely a clear game. To play. Then third reaction could be knight b3. Uh, according to many articles, books, and players, uh, this is the refutation of the system. You bring it back, and at the moment you threaten to take this piece. I'm talking about the pawn on f3. They gotta defend it, and you immediately, without wasting your time, gotta go with this b5 move. They have to play h5, you play b4. They gotta go knight d5, you take. They can't play queen d5 because you take on c2. So they gotta take by pawn. And here, you play a5. I wanna show you a game between Nigel Short against Book CNG, played back to 2004. 
where this guy, Nigel, went for bishop h6. Rook cmg captured, took on c2, and probably Nigel thought like queen e2, I take on g6, and he cannot defend me. Rook cmg captured on d1, which was practically the only move, took on g6, and after knight d4, since the f3 pawn is hanging, played rook f7. Complete unclear position, but if you ask me, this is with the practically better chances for black. In the game, it was drawn, uh, but I believe, so the game was drawn, but I believe that if someone can push for a win, that can be black. And finally, bishop e2. According to most of the guys, bishop e2 should be the refutation of this line. And I gotta be honest with you, uh, objectively, bishop e2 is the most dangerous move. Like a few months ago, I played a blitz tournament and I played against Serbian vice champion who's around 22 uh, under 18, uh, who's around 22 feet, 2200 feet, and he played bishop e2. I just have to tell you, there is a famous game between Sotovsky and Hodgson, and not that known game. Uh, played by Magnus Carlsen in this position with black pieces when he was like younger. They all lost with black pieces. But I once again have to tell you that I literally won like a whole bunch of games using the following plan. So fasten your seat belts and let me just show you. You anyways, second exchange. Oops, sorry, uh, not here. But even this uh, idea exists in many of the dragon positions, this for C4. I just played it uh, uh, unintentionally. So uh, b5 you can play, and uh, a couple of my students used it in the past, uh, once again with the idea of sacking the pawn, but you can easily sack an exchange. When they take it, you take it, and they go like this. And you go rook c8, and they go king b2. And the crucial move comes now. I know for most of you, this is going to be like so difficult to accept that we can play this position being down an exchange, but they have a broken pawn structure. And that's the compensation that we're actually relying on. Bishop e8. That's a specialty. In order to be able to retreat this knight to b6, c5, and eventually it goes to an ideal a4 square. When they go h5, knight f to d7, h takes, h takes. You don't care about the bishop h6. They cannot mate you. The queens are not on the board. And you just want to go with the knight b6 and knight a4. I want most of my games played in playing like this. There is another interesting thing here. Uh, Grandmaster Stojanovic uh, from Republic of Srpska. He played it against me in Blitz and he played King B2. I played Rook E8 and he was the only one who in this position used Knight B3 just in time. And when I played Knight E7, he didn't want to take because B6 traps the bishop. I'm threatening now uh, knight f3 followed by rook c3. That's a very nice tactical trick. He played bishop d4. And this is the only way to oppose the bishop, to defend the pawn. And in a way, any knight b6 happens. They can just take it, spoil these pawns. At least we have a bishop there. At least we uh, cap the dragon bishop. And they have a... Um, we have like that... A uh, pretty nice practical counter chance, mainly thanks to this weak pawn on c3, but I lost that blitz game, for example. And finally, uh, what's gonna happen if in these situations they just go with the 95? We're coming back to my game on Iceland. Uh, the guy just looked straight into my eyes, like, hmm, this guy is an IM. Uh, maybe if he was in the bar, he would just say, ah, that's the guy uh who was who was fairly drunk that game and uh probably he blundered this queen a5 and he just straight look into my eyes i was trying to be a little bit tricky i put my you know like you like this like i really blundered and he played 95. as soon as he played 95 i instantly took on b2 he instantly took on e7 uh proudly you know like taking this on e7 and like uh, after king h2 rook to d2 look at this a rook is hanging i gotta move it and i'm moving it here then once again like a whole bunch of games including candidate masters fms 
lots of these guys realized that the knight is hanging. They just went with the knight d5. I capture. I take on f3. And when you take on f3, I just bring the bishop back. I got a bit. I have a bishop here. Pawn uh, g4 is about to fall. Uh, they're weak on the back rank. I won't make this like 20 games probably. And uh, they cannot hold this position either. And finally, what happened in my game was that he played h5. Uh, that's practically the only move. And according to the engine, it also leads, thanks to a move that I played here, uh, to a better position for black. But here, I remember, I was thinking for 45 minutes and had to find like absolutely the most accurate move in this position. And after like 45 minutes of thinking, because previously I was just blitzing out, I played the refutation of the line. Watch out, he threatens h6, not just to get the piece back, uh, but also to open up, to take the dragon bishop, to take the control of the dark squares. He's going to have like a great position. I played knight eg4. What's so special about this refutation knight eg4? I remember at that time, no one ever played this move. And it's it, it was considered to be a strong novel. Even uh, another dragon expert, uh, Grandmaster Chris Ward from England, analyzed this game of mine on his just publishing site. And after f takes g4, I took on e4, and I realized that now I open up space for my bishop. He cannot go with h6 anymore. I'm threatening his rook, and I'm also threatening his knight. And on top of all that, I even have the knight g3 threatening the rook and the bishop on f1. The guy played rook d on h2, I took on e7, he took on g6, and I remember I had to imagine everything uh, before I even started with knight e4 on the 16th move. After rook h7, king g8, just to make sure that he didn't have any tactics here. And he didn't. He just continued to play g takes, rook takes, played bishop c4, I took on h1, he took on h1. I took on e3, and uh, my opponent realized uh, that he was like completely lost, and he did threw he threw the towel into the ring. The thing is, uh, if he plays rook f1, uh, another very nice uh, and a tricky move was expecting him. He cannot take because bishop f1. If he takes by bishop, I take by rook, and on. Um, the other hand, I'm just threatening rook f1 with checkmate in case of some bishop e6, rook e6, knight e6. Guys, hope that you enjoyed in this analysis. Uh, there were like a unbelievable number of requests to show you some of my analysis in the dragon. For the first time, I shared with you something special. This was, uh, this was for 10,000 uh, subscribers. Uh, I just wish you to have like half of success and wins in these variations and with these lines that I used to. It's gonna be more than enough. Thank you so much and let's go for another great number in the future on this channel. Thank you so much, bye-bye.